Welcome to the Mets Pod presented by Tri State Cadillac. On today's show, we're back from spring training, but we have interviews from Port St. Lucie with Mets pitcher Mike Vassell and director of player development Andrew Christie. We break down the latest from the games, including the rotation, the young players that had a cup of coffee with the big league team, and the spotlight being on Brett Beatty and, of course, Mark Vientos. As always, we close out the show answering your mailbag questions. So subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, You can watch every episode on SMY's YouTube channel or wherever you get your shows. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Elevate your style in a Cadillac. Go from bold to bolder in an SUV, from inspiring to awe-inspiring in a sedan. Visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today. And of course, here's a reminder to subscribe to the show at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SMY's YouTube channel, or wherever you get your podcasts. Of course, a welcome back, Joe. We are back in New York. A great trip down at spring training in Port St. Lucie. My first time. You've been there a couple times, but first time as media. Just uh, to kind of put a bow on the trip, Joe, what did you think? I mean, it's been a minute since we talked. I I talked your ear off for a couple days in Port St. Lucie, so you insisted on taking a week off of the podcast. You couldn't deal with that uh, for for much longer. I went to the combine. (laughs) (laughs) But Port St. Lucie, I mean, it was a great time, like you said. Uh, Being there on media and, for me, being able to go into the clubhouse and talk to Jet Williams, to talk to Drew Gilbert, uh, to talk to Christian Scott, and Mike Vassell, who you will hear that interview here in, in today's show, and, you know, a bunch of young players and really grasping from them that they see where the organization is headed. They see the opportunity in front of them to make an impact at the big league level. It wasn't a lot of, you know, I'm just working on things and kind of generic answers. They're very um, aware of what's going on with the Mets right now. And that that's exciting. I completely agree. Just walking around the clubhouse, you and I getting to talk to a lot of the different young pitchers. I mean, how just into it these guys are. I mean, this is the generation that they grasp analytics. They are willing to change things within um, their mechanics, of course, and the pitch it actually getting to talk to guys that have gone in the pitching lab. The pitching lab has been a mystery to us, the fan base, everybody. So You'll hear some of that conversation specifically with Mike Vassell. And, of course, the show we got to have outside Clover Park. I mean, shout out to the Mets fans that stopped by. It it really was impressive how many people stopped by the show, took a picture, asked a question on the air, asked a question off the air. We love meeting you guys. We have so much fun. We love the passion, whether it's optimism, whether it's pessimism. It really, really is what makes this show so much fun. So thank you uh, to everybody. We had a blast down there. And just a little tease, we're working on the same kind of format, but it's City Field. We've done shows from the Cadillac Club. We've done shows from City Field. We're looking forward to getting back to City Field this season. So we'll have more on that soon. And in the meantime, we didn't come home without souvenirs. Let's go down on the farm and roll our interview with Mets pitching prospect Mike Vassell from Port St. Lucie. Take a listen. All right, the Mets pod here with Mike Vassell. Really excited, hopefully, Mike, to see you with the big league club this year. When you go into a season like this where the expectations are different, right? You pitch for a big college program. You pitch all across every level of the minors. But this year, the chatter with the fans is hoping to see you with the big league club at some point. Does that change your focus at all, or do you go into it like every other year? Yeah, I mean, first off, thank you for uh, having me on. But I think... You know, for this season, obviously, there's a, a lot that, you know, can happen. And, and obviously, it's a little bit different than your first season starting in St. Lucie or something like that. But I think the goal has never changed. It's really always been the same, you know, try and get to the big leagues and stay there and win the New York Mets ball games. And I just think the reality of it is this year, it's a lot closer than years past. So it's it's exciting. Um, I'm excited. My family, um, all of our, like the guys have come up together, really excited because we're all really close. And I think that's uh, what makes it special. And yeah, we're, yeah. we're kind of all together. So what is that like with family and friends? I mean, I'm sure every time you see them, they're like, hey, it's, you're one step away now. I mean, it feels a little different. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think for uh, my friends, like back home from high school and college and everything, I think it's been awesome. Um you know, they're, they're extremely supportive. And then my family, um, they've been tremendous through, you know, 
my entire life with baseball. So it's it's you know uh, someday hopefully when that does happen they'll be they'll be there for sure. And um, but yeah, especially with the, the other guys too. There's no guarantee that an entire draft class with a core of pitchers are all of a sudden gonna be in big league camp three years later and and on the brink of the major leagues and AAA and everything. So I think that's also what really makes it pretty cool. Yeah, when you mentioned that and. That's Christian Scott, it's yourself, and Dom Hamill, all from the same draft class in Big League Camp together. What kind of relationship do you guys have? Because you kind of, in a way, came through the system together, and now you're both, all three of you, on the precipice here. Yeah, I think it's been it's been pretty special. You know, I think each one of us has kind of had their own path to getting, like, here right now, um, which I think has been cool. You know, like Dom had... His first season just absolutely dominated one pitcher of the year. Christian yeah. um, last year dominated one pitcher of the year. I'm the odd man out. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But you know, it's been it's been awesome because I think I think each one of us is really unique in what we do, but we all have you know similar pitches on the mound, so we can have conversations. And then also outside of the field, like we're all friends, and I think that's pretty rare is that like you have guys that actually really get along and care about each other because. Obviously, this is an extremely competitive environment, but it was never like that from day one. It was all about us together, and I think that's what's pretty special. Um, and I hope you know someday all of us can be there at the same time, um, and that would be even more special. So, Now that you've been through so many different levels of baseball, not just college, but all through the minors, what have the adjustments been like as, quite simply, the hitters just get so much better at each level or at least different approaches? Yeah, I think – the the really interesting thing last year was getting to AAA is that I was never really used to hitters being able to really adjust within a bat within a couple pitches. I think that's what um, I had to get used to. So, um, you know, in, in the conversations we had, like the elite of elite hitters at AA um, would still be extremely elite at AAA, but the difference is maybe some of the guys in the AA lineup are different than, you know, your guy in a seven hole for in Scranton, who's got, you know, four or five years under his belt in the big leagues, and he just happens to be there. Um, nothing to say against the guy in double-A. It's just the reality yeah. of what triple-A is. So I think that was an adjustment for me, for sure. Um, but I think, you know, going through each level and coming out of college, and every, I've learned something new at every level, and I think that now that I've gotten to triple-A, I understand, okay, like what it takes at each level to then get to the big leagues. And, um you know, I, I still don't know everything. I don't know it all. I'm still learning as, you know, for guys who've been in the league for 14 years are still learning. But that's the exciting part about it. Which one was the most startling adjustment? Was it college just to a level of pro ball or could it be to AAA, like you said, where the hitters are just smarter, honestly? Yeah, I think I think my biggest adjustment was probably getting to AAA. I think, um, you know, from college to pro ball, they, they did a great job at, like, really preparing us for our first full season. Um, a lot of us didn't even throw in low A. Um, we just kind of did rookie ball, but it was a lot about development, and I think that's what was awesome about the org. They got us, like, very prepared for our first full season, um, and I think that really helped a lot of guys. Like, we had a crazy team um, in 22 in low A that was, like, pitchers-wise just dominating. Like, we were dominating everybody, and I think you slowly saw all those guys start to – go up. So I think definitely the biggest adjustment was AAA, but I also think that um, at the same time, once you start to get in a groove, you're, you're, you're able to pitch kind of at any level. So let's go back to that. When you talk about entering pro ball, Mm -hmm. you kind of changed your repertoire, Mm -hmm. similar to more what you were in high school, right? Mm -hmm. Because we went to UVA, Virginia, did more sinker slider and you kind of adjusted. So what kind of, uh, help were the Mets when you kind of came in and said, we want you to throw like this differently than you threw in college? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, it was it was pretty interesting because I think I always knew that there was something out there. And like now it seems simple of like, oh, it was just, you know, my carry on my fastball. And like, I understand the numbers and everything. Yeah. Um, but it's crazy because like when I got drafted, I really had no idea like how to read those measurements, what they meant. Um, you know, spin efficiency and tilt and that. And it seems like very simple stuff, but it really does go that far. So I think what they really helped me with is just like coming and being like, hey, like you can have a lot of more swing and miss, uh, miss in zone and strikeouts if you do, you know, X, Y, and Z, pretty simple things. And I was like, wow. And then all of a sudden I take it to end game and I'm getting that result. And it's like, hey, if you do this small mechanical thing, 
we think you'll get a couple miles an hour. I make the adjustment, it happens. So it's like, it's pretty hard for me to sit here and like not have full trust in what the player development is doing because it's like, I've seen it work. So that's what was like tremendous. Like I couldn't have been happier. Like when I first got drafted of when I came into the end of the summer, the improvements I saw, I was like, wow, like this is definitely a great place and a great fit for me. Us and fans hear so much about pitching labs and obviously the Mets building a pitching lab. I mean, for somebody that literally does this for a living, just what is the general, you know, premise of the pitching lab and what do you as a professional athlete get out of something like that? Yeah, I think it's um, I don't know if you guys have seen the lab, but it feels top secret at this point. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I so I'd never done a lab like this before. Um, And we were it was like the last week of the season after We'd finished up and I came down here and my first reaction was like, whoa, like, what is this? Like walking in, it's just so many cameras and um, it's just like extremely clean in there. Like, it's just a crazy experience. So um, basically, like you have all these like little sensors on you and they get the whole like biomechanical data, everything. Um, And what we did basically in talking to Kyle Rogers on the other side, who's integration pitching coach like he so what he really helped me with was you know like these this drill package for the offseason like really focus on this like what's one thing you want to do mechanically that we think you can do to you know maybe a couple ticks on the higher end but also just raise your floor for velo you know keep that velo there for the whole season and like that was my focus and it like was really small things and it's just a few drills a few times a week but like that's what baseball is like yeah, guys can have massive adjustments within a day or two, but it's pretty rare, especially mechanically for pitchers. So it was the entire offseason just hammering away at this. Um, and I came back, and I, I feel like I'm in a pretty good spot. Um, velocity, you know, it is similar to where it was last year, but it also feels like I'm recovering better, I'm moving better, um, my stuff just feels sharper. Um, and that's, like, kind of the results I think myself and the org wanted to see. So. So last thing going back, uh, you, when you were in AAA Syracuse, obviously that's where the ABS system comes in. And you had little ups and downs. It yeah. got better as, as the season went on. What was it like adjusting to the ABS system? Because obviously that's something that's coming down the pike in baseball. That's why they're doing it in AAA. Mm-hmm. Uh, but how was that adjustment to kind of realize you, you may not get that ball that's like an inch off the plate that you would have with a just regular you know, human umpire? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. It, it really is tough. Like at first, like um, I think it was Tuesday through Thursday was just flat out yeah. ABS. So, um, and then uh, Friday through Sunday you'd have challenge. So we, what I found difficult um, for myself is first like the top of the zone and everything. That's really something I worked on throwing like strikes at the top early in the zone in the off season prior, and you know that's like something you mechanically get in tune with. And now all of a sudden I'm like. I don't want to bring my forcing down to a guy's thigh high because that's kind of where they hit the forcing fastball. Um, so like that was an adjustment. I think it was more like me competing with myself to be like, all right, like, come on, like you got to be able to make this adjustment, but you also have to realize it's going to take time. Like, um, and, and just trust yourself. And, you know, with off speed, you got to realize now you have to, and what I also, after talking to guys though, it's like, okay, off speed though, in the big leagues, it's the same thing. Guys, aren't going to chase maybe a four seam, a north south guy like off the plate a ton. Like you're going to have to go down over the plate below the zone and above the zone later in count. So it was things I was going to have to work on anyway. I just think it kind of sped up that process of knowing that. Um, But yeah, it was difficult. But I think that at a certain point you run into teams who are so good at challenging too, where you think you get a strike, boom. Like I can think of Buffalo last year was just incredible at challenges. And we were just like, boom, like, Oh, they get it back. They get it back. And so you get teams like that. And that's the reality of it though. And you kind of just have to accept it and move on and keep going. Mike Vassell, I know we're excited and the fans are excited to see you on the city field mound this year, man. Best of luck. And thank you for the time. Definitely. Thank you very much. That was Mets pitcher Mike Vassell, who we expect and hope to see make his debut at City Field this year with the Big League Club. Joe, what did you think? It was great that we got some uh, time with Vassell just to kind of pick his brain on his development. A guy that you've talked a lot about, you know, when he was in high school, was viewed as a potential first rounder. He goes to college, his stock dropped a little bit, and it feels like since he's been drafted by the Mets, they've gotten him back on track to what made him such a promising young pitcher coming out of high school. 
it was good to get his perspective on that. So I made sure to specifically ask him about how he was highly regarded in high school and then in college, how they kind of changed his repertoire where they decided to make him into a sinker slider pitcher. And when he came into pro ball, the Mets kind of remembered how they scouted him as a high school player. They're like, that was really good. What he did in Virginia was not. So let's try to work our way back towards some of his high school repertoire and pitch profiles. And then, of course, uh, Eric Yeager's and the staff and the pitching lab, which uh, Mike Vassell gave us a great answer to kind of describe how that whole place really works. Between the combination of those factors, I think that is what has made Mike Vassell uh, into a legitimate pitching prospect that, like you said, Connor, we expect to see at City Field sometime in 2024. I like the philosophy of this pick. You take a guy in the eighth round that before his college career had round one talent and he's a big dude. He's not an outlier inside already six, five, two forty four. Um, somebody that has stuff. And it's not like he was an abomination at, at college at Virginia. He just didn't live up to the expectations. And like you said, Joe, the Mets look at players like that and go, well, you have the talent, you have the physical and mental makeup, including the work ethic. We just need to kind of hone in on uh, what you should be doing on the mound. And and we really can't wait to see what Basil can do with the big league club. And, you know, we didn't get to uh, record it, but we did get to have a conversation in the clubhouse with Christian Scott, another guy that's in that group of pitchers that are kind of rising through the system together. Joe, and I thought the conversation was pretty similar in a, in a good way, where when you talk to him and Vassal, so locked in, invested in every aspect of pitching, the pitching lab conversation, the competence, once again, the size, right? These are big guys on the mound. And, you know, that's traditionally how the game goes. Uh, if you want to talk about guys that have workhorse potential or can, uh, you know, be an actual part of the rotation and give you a lot of innings. So it was great. We got to talk to both of them, Joe. Yeah, Christian Scott, my top pitching prospect in the system. Just talking about his his new sweeper and stuff that he's working on where now he has the sweeper and the gyro slider so he has two different looks you know the gyro slider is more closer to what a jacob de grom slider is like where it kind of drops and the sweeper is just kind of directly across so he has different profiles on two different sliders obviously his fastball uh is up into the mid 90s and he shows the ability to elevate that pitch and frankly hearing his perspective on the pitching lab. I know we're going to talk pitching lab, pitching lab, pitching lab, but him talking about the force plates and how if he put a certain amount of weight on his back leg, that would help him be able to maintain his velocity into games. So Christian Scott, uh, obviously a very highly regarded pitcher in the system right now and someone who truly gets uh, the new age technology. All right, one more interview from our time down in Florida. Joe, you had the chance to catch up with Mets Director of Player Development, Andrew Christie. So take a listen to that conversation. And we're joined by Mets Director of Player Development, Andrew Christie. How's it going, Andrew? Thanks for joining us. Great, Joe. Thanks for having me. Happy to be on. So you've been with the Mets organization for a few years now. What has been the biggest changes you've seen in the player development process over your time being with the Mets? Yeah, well, I've, I've been here since 2018. I actually started on the scouting side for the first three years I was here. So uh, very different exposure. I wouldn't, I would say I, I wasn't super plugged into the player development realm uh, till like late 2020, early 2021. Um, I think, you know, we're seeking to improve processes all the time, uh, even now uh, that I'm like, I've been in it for a few years. Uh, the, the change is kind of just continuing to chip away at the objectivity we can bring to the table, um, how we can kind of target areas for development for our players based on more and more information, more and more accurate information. Um, and that's grown throughout the game. So I, I don't think uh, it's anything crazy. It's just about how well we can potentially execute and get the information to our players and use that to get them better. How do you balance an organizational philosophy versus also having kind of like individualized goals for each individual? player because obviously you want like an overarching plan but you also want to tailor to each individual skill set how do you balance that uh toe that line there yeah i think uh I, I, individual development is is the pinnacle of what we what we do in player development that's what we want to do for every single player so i think that's 
uh, often perceived as like, we have to do that and that's it. Uh, but one thing that um, my new boss, Andy Green, has brought to us already is really uh, uh, striving to build the culture of what a Met does, and what a Met brings to the table every single day. Uh, and that, I think, helps drive the individual development. I don't think they're necessarily in opposition at all. I think uh, the culture is set by the leader, uh, the, the, the people around the leader, uh, myself included, try to assist in setting that tone. Uh, and then as we go down to the player level, we get as individual as possible with every single player. Um, and it's only because that culture of, of building those players in that way is set uh, at the top that we can actually get to the individual level and, and try to drive that sort of development that you're talking about as much as possible. So I think everyone has Jet Williams as the number one prospect in the system, anywhere you read. Organizationally, tell us what you guys like the most about Jet Williams. <laughs> um, I don't want to speak for the whole org. All right, you. I think, How about you? Yes, I yeah. think, I think uh, most people like basically everything uh, that he does on the baseball field. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, personally, I think his hit tool is, is what stands out. Um, if you ask uh, our, uh, my good friend uh, and, and former boss, Tommy Tanis, he would say he's got the best eye he's seen since Brandon Nimmo. Like, that certainly stands out. Uh, if he can do that in the big leagues, we'd be in a really, really good spot. So I think you ask anybody, uh, the opinions will vary. But I, 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 he does everything well. It's, and that's why he's, he's in big league camp. It's, it's why he's so high on all those lists. And that's why we're so excited for him uh, to, to be in our organization. So I rank top 30 prospects in the system. And, you know, there's obviously wide ranging of players from guys that are on the cusp of the big leagues. Ryan Mauricio's still on the list because he's still eligible. He appeared in the big leagues. Who are some under the radar prospects within the system that you think, you know, maybe top third, like maybe when I've made my top three, but someone that you think Mets fans should keep an eye on that maybe even someone like me is not talking about? Yeah, there, there are a few. Um, as we, uh, <laughs> as I've, as I've said before, like I think like I could go for two hours on this topic, but um, I'll pick a few. One guy who's really stood out in camp thus far. Huge credit to our entire pitching group uh, on helping develop this guy's Candido Cuevas. Um, pitched a little bit in St. Lucie last year uh, with, with Dan McKinney. He's worked extensively with Victor Ramos, Miguel Bonilla, our guys at the Academy, Wander Cabrera, Christian Martinez, Dakota Herman. Um, they've done an in, in, incredibly good job setting him up for success, building his arsenal like one pitch at a time, really dialing in his fastball, then moving to, to developing. He, he came with a good curveball. Let's move to developing a slider. Um, and he's pretty dialed in right now in, in, in that regard. I think more exposure to gameplay is, is what he needs. He's going to get it this year, uh, but he looks outstanding right now. Um, I think another guy uh, we brought up potentially some of our younger international signees, they don't get as much attention as uh, I think they they probably deserve off the bat. Uh, obviously, we signed Giovanni Rodriguez. Uh, he's gotten a lot of attention, rightfully so. He's one of the best international players I've, I've seen. I saw him four years ago now um first <laughs> for the first time uh he, he's just gotten better and better but another guy is edward lantigua uh c- kind of came on a little late and uh, relative to <laughs> to how early you generally scout these guys and uh just a long wiry outfielder who's got all the tools puts together incredibly impressive at bats um he can run uh it's it's impressive to watch him huge kudos to to uh, our, our international group, uh, Steve Barningham, Tommy, yeah, aforementioned Tommy Tanis, uh, Rosario Chiavaro, th- those guys, and the scouts on the ground do a great job. Um, there's more There's more there, too. Like, I, Leandy Mea is somebody that I don't think a lot of guy, guys have heard of, but uh, he's going to play shortstop, and his hit tool, just the, the at-bats he puts together in live settings in the Dominican are, are really, really impressive, just high degree of uh, confidence in knowing the strike zone, uh, incredible amount of uh, barrel control and ability to make contact. Um, and he's really young and he's, he's going to grow into some power, we think, as well. So uh, those are a few of the guys internationally. I think, I think one more that's uh, at the upper levels that I think uh, could, could really take off this year. Uh, among a, we, we have a large group of, of relief pitching prospects that I think in double and triple A could take off. One that's really been impressive this spring is Hunter Parsons. Uh, he'll definitely get some innings on the on the major league side, hopefully coming up here soon. But uh, really impressive four pitch mix that he's dialed in. 
quite well towards the back half of last season and, and coming into spring this year. Velocity's continued to tick up uh, since we got him. Outstanding human and, and really kind of moves the needle. Um, has moved the needle each year he's been in the system. So uh, there's there's a lot more guys I could I could name check. I, I won't keep you here all day, but uh, but yeah, those are those are four guys to watch. So obviously, unfortunately, the Mets' first half last season didn't go well. But on the player development side, that meant you got access to Drew, Drew Gilbert and Ryan Clifford and Jeremy Rodriguez and Luis Angel Acuna and all these prospects that came over in the trades. Give us kind of a feel of those guys and how excited were you, despite what was happening to the Mets, that you guys were going to be getting access to talents like that. Yeah, of course. We, we never want to uh, make a habit of, of getting guys at the trade deadline, right. getting prospects. But uh, when it does happen, when the opportunity presents itself, I think we, we organizationally made the right decision last year and really happy with the guys we brought back. I would just say overall, the quality of their character has has been outstanding across the board. Um, very, uh, it's it's very easy to get caught up in the tools and the players they are, uh, and and they are all of that for sure. Uh, but like even the first time I met Ronald Hernandez and Marco Vargas, they came into the, into the clubhouse in the in the complex here in Florida. Um, just brought great energy, instantly meshed with their teammates, uh, got along great with staff, willing and eager to be coached and, and get better. Uh, it's really it, it makes our jobs easy when when those guys have bring that attitude to the table, and I would say that about legitimately every single guy we got at the deadline, um, which is not always the case. And it was it was really cool to have that this year. Uh, huge credit to our pro personnel and pro scouting group for digging in on those details. I think that's something that is often um, discounted by people in the game. So, like pro scouts, you got all the stats you need, you got all the video and tech and data that you have. Uh, you do, but you you don't realize how much the the contents of uh, of the character of the individual player is going to you know either inhibit or really allow their development to take off. Uh, and, and with these guys, uh, it's definitely doing the latter. It's it's going to allow them to continue to develop and, and take off and hopefully be uh, contributors for the Mets soon. Last one for you: What are big picture player development goals for twenty twenty four? Uh, big picture is just to be the best in baseball. That's pretty simple. Uh, Andy's set that vision out for us. Uh, I think we're day by day just trying to get to that vision. Um, you know, there's a, an immense number of things that goes into that, developing developing our players on an individual basis, developing our staff members, developing our collective staffs, working with the performance staff to really mesh our processes so that everything possible we can do to move the needle, we do. Uh, I, I think those are kind of high level and uh, we just want to be the best at it. We want to be better than the other 29 teams and uh, our hope is to do that relentlessly every single day uh, from here till the till the off season starts and then continue doing that in the off season because that that is a an area I think we pride ourselves on here especially due to the uh, resources we have with Steve being so supportive now really leaning into our off season programming and development. I, I think it's where we can make the the most games with our players. Uh, this isn't a new concept to you. you. You've seen these guys come in in best shape of your life. Uh, that's not by accident. That's a lot of, of time and energy and effort from our staff uh, really putting effort into developing these players. And it's a ton of time and energy and effort from our players uh, trying to get better themselves. So I think it's a, it's a full year job and our staff sees it as such. And that's what we need to do to be the best in baseball. So uh, that's the, that's the overarching goal. It's not too complex. That's what we want to be, and uh, I think we're we're striving to get there every day. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, good luck this season. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it, man. All right, Joe. Great job getting to talk to the Mets director of player development, Andrew Christie, who a guy that has really rose throughout the system. Joe it feels like I think he's been with the team five or six years now. Uh, what what did you think of just having that face time with him down there? Yeah, Andrew Christie started with the Mets in 2018 and obviously rose to now second in command just behind Vice President of Player Development, Andy Green. And honestly, my favorite part of the conversation was just talking about the under the radar prospects. You know, we talk about Jet Williams on this show and all of the top prospects, and he just started listing off names. And I was thinking in my head, if if we weren't recording this, we could have just talked for another 45 minutes about all these under the radar prospects. So it's 
it's good to talk to someone in that level of position with the true knowledge and has seen all of these prospects, not just the top ones, but the ones that even someone like me, I'm not talking about yet, but maybe I should. All right. We can't not include in the open the biggest news of the week with the pitching staff. We often find ourselves talking about what you heard with the young guys, new pitches, mechanical adjustments during spring training. How about new haircuts? Joe, Sean Mania looks like a forget completely different pitcher. He's a completely different human being out there. The conversation around Mania was all about the sweeper. Now the conversation has pivoted to Mania. He let the long hair go, the beard go. I mean, who is this in the Mets rotation right now? He said he hasn't gotten a haircut in four years. He had one not great spring training outing and the hair had to go. I mean, this, I, I couldn't believe it. And uh, obviously the, the tan line is what did it for me. The beard tan line, where it's just like, you could tell where his beard was just white, uh, light skin there and uh, tanner everywhere else on the face. But, you know, Sean Mania, I, I don't know what you're thinking, man. I love the flow. But I, I'd love to get more more on that. Well, we're all about the results. So if Manaya thought it was uh, a good omen. It listen, worked for Jacob deGrom. It worked for Jacob deGrom. Artemi Panarin shaved his head after the Rangers lost in the playoffs last year. He's in the MVP conversation. There is a history of New York athletes having a lot of success with this method. All right, you're listening to the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can watch every episode on SMY's YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts. A couple of spring training quick hitters here, Joe, rapid fire. Let's start with the prospects that got a taste and were sent back to minor league camp. What was your surface level thoughts on those guys getting that cup of coffee with the big league club? I mean, it's great for guys like Jet Williams and Luis Angel Acuna to spend so much time with Francisco Lindor. We mentioned that uh, on our live show from Port St. Lucie that those guys were kind of glued to Lindor's hip, and Lindor was showing them after every rep what they did what they did well, where they could take a step forward, and that's you know the the leadership of Francisco Lindor, and then a guy like Drew Gilbert. In, in the game where he was facing the lefty and he fought off the 0-2 or 1-2 breaking ball into left field to drive in a couple runs with the bases loaded, shows the kind of mature type of hitter that Drew Gilbert is. And, you know, just seeing these guys in person and, of course, in, in batting practice as well on the backfields where they really could show off their ability to barrel up the ball. I, I think there are exciting days coming here in the next, you know, Certainly this season, when you look at guys like Gilbert and Acuna, but a guy like Jet Williams in the next, I don't know, season, season and a half. I thought defensively, they already looked like major leaguers. It's just about the approach at the plate and the bats catching up. And when they're ready, the Mets will know and, and we'll be really excited to watch them. All right. An actual major leaguer, Jeff McNeil, left biceps discomfort. Per Carlos Mendoza, he's feeling a lot better. He's not going to get an MRI or other tests. They expect him back soon. But this would have been technically our second scare of the spring already, Joe. But it seems like good news for McNeil. I will say, anytime you hear McNeil connected to an injury, it is concerning because he's a guy with an injury history. And, I mean, you're talking about the bad, former batting champ. The Mets need a healthy Jeff McNeil if they want to make a wild card push this year. They certainly need a healthy Jeff McNeil. But when... Uh, you talk about not even getting an MRI and he's been shut down for a few days. I, I think he's supposed to take batting practice here in the next day or two. So it seems like it might just be a, you know, a, a delayed start to the spring for Jeff McNeil. But frankly, I don't know how many spring training at bats Jeff McNeil needs anyway. So just get healthy and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see you later this spring for, you know, a few at bats and just get ready for opening day. The only guy to even come close to getting a hit off of Edwin Diaz, it feels like, in uh, in all the Mets batting practice so far. All right, the starting rotation. I'll kick off with Luis Severino here, Joe. Two innings, shutout innings, the strikeout against Matt Carpenter on 98-mile-per-hour fastball. We know, we've know we talked about this. With Severino, it's really all about the health. We don't think, despite the numbers not being pretty last year, that the stuff has been overall uh, significantly impacted. I think... He is the biggest variable on the team to me, Joe. It's not Starling Marte, and he's really close. It's not McNeil or when Senga comes back. I think the Mets, 
being a true annoyance in the National League, right? That team that won't go away in the NL wildcard run is going to be really dependent on if we're getting a Severino that's ho- hovering around three RA and making all of his starts or a guy that can't pitch promising start for Severino. He looked fantastic. I mean, the fastball was 94 to 96, like you said, up to 98. The changeup was a pitch that he struggled with, with the Yankees last year. The changeup looked really, really good in, in his first outing there. And the slider, he wasn't locating it kind of the way you would want, but you saw how crisp the breaking ball is. I think Severino coming out of that start, which means, you know, we'll, we'll see how the next start goes. But coming out of the first start, you have to be optimistic uh, as to where Luis Severino looks right now. All right, the last one here. How about Brett Beatty and Mark Vientos here, Joe? Unfortunately, uh, on the day we are recording, Beatty had a really, really nice line drive single against the Yankees to drive in a run. I feel like it was a slow start for these guys. But we talked about the variable on the mound that Severino is. There's no denying Beatty and Vientos, who are going to get a legit chance to play out of the gate this season, have to get going for this franchise. I mean, they've been off to slow starts. They're, you know, we don't worry so much about spring training statistics. But when I look at Mark Vientos, what's standing out to me is he's hitting the ball hard. So he has he has the one home run that he hit into the wind to right field, and it just kept going. Apo uh, so Taco, too. Now, yeah, that's Vientos has legitimate opposite opposite field power, uh, but he's hitting the ball hard. Beatty, what was concerning me early on was it was ground balls again, which is when Brett Beatty is not right. It's when he's smacking the ball into the ground. Then he hit the home run at 112 miles an hour off the bat. And like you said, line drive single against the Yankees. It's a little bit of a mixed bag with what Beatty's showing so far this spring, but he's going to get that opportunity as we lead into opening day to really establish himself uh, on a day-to-day basis as a third baseman. All right, let's jump into a mailbag question here from Dean Julia, who sent a really good one, a longer one. He said, longer one, sorry. Longer question that I've been thinking about. Since the feeling of this year is more of a transition year, does it make sense to give Nimmo a chance to be a run producer in this lineup slotted in the five hole behind Alonzo? It feels silly to say, given his age, but I feel like the recent power surge from Nimmo has me thinking about what his ceiling could be in that role, especially with the leadoff profile type guys coming up like Jet. If you want to pitch around Alonzo, Nimmo is going to give you a tough at bat. And you might be walking two in a row, or maybe Nimmo taps into power and hits 30 bombs. His plate discipline could be very beneficial in that spot. Thoughts? Joe, I thought that, that number one, this is something we have never discussed. Number two, I thought this is really, really an interesting idea because of the wave of players that are coming and the type of players that they are. What do you think of the potential? It feels like the unthinkable, right? The unfathomable, but nimmo in the five hole at some point i think it's certainly within uh the realm of possibility going forward i don't know how much you want to do it this year at least early on i think you you want to keep him in that leadoff spot where he's still getting on base for the boppers like lindor and alonzo but if we're looking ahead and projecting ahead and maybe jet williams is someone that's a leadoff hitter for you or luis on Acuna is someone that's a leadoff hitter for you and Let's play it. Let's play for fun. You sign Juan Soto. Now, all of a sudden, you have this really stat, like top of your order with, you know, a, a traditional leadoff type of guy in Jet who's on base and speed. And then Soto, Lindor, and Alonso. And you could drop Nimmo down into that five spot. Um, I, I just would want to make sure that he is not deviating from his regular plan like i don't want nimmo to start selling out to try to hit 30 home runs and then drop his on base percentage 30 points or something because he's trying to hit home runs instead of taking the bases that are in front of him but i would say if nimmo's power surge from 2023 is able to be replicated in 2024 then i think we're looking at a potential he might be more of a middle of the order hitter instead of a top of the order hitter Without a doubt, Nimmo coming off a great year in 2023, 24 home runs. That was his career high by seven. He had 17 in 2018. I mean, we've talked about this with Nimmo. The on-base percentage 
was down 363. He is typically a guy that you believe can hang right around 400, 380 to 400. So the on base percentage was down. The power was up. He is not a stolen base threat. He is somebody that, as Dean brought up, the approach is phenomenal. He's going to give you really, really hard at bats. I think that might be the counter in all of this because we love Jet Williams and we think Jet Williams is going at a, you know, crazy pace through the system that Francesco Alvarez went through. And Jet Williams is a guy that is going to be known for having that Nimmo's batter eye where he's going to work counts and really make pitchers work. But he's not here right now. And when he comes up here, when he is up with the big league club, I don't think he's going to be in the top five of the order out of the gate. So the best thing for the Mets right now is that weapon that is Nimmo where he can give you an eight to 10 pitch at bat out of the gate and really wear into a starter's pitch workload right away. But for the long-term future, I don't think this is wild at all. Maybe it's not the five hole, but maybe it is fifth or sixth, right? When, when Jet is what we think he will be, he profiles as that leadoff type hitter. You still have Francisco Lindor batting two or three. You have Pete Alonso, who should be your cleanup hitter. Francisco Alvarez, we think, is going to be a really nice five hitter. But you do wonder, with Nimmo, the power going up is great. The on-base going down is not what you want to see, but it's not that he's a less impactful player than he's been. Arguably, he's a more impactful player, but there's no denying he is a different player, Joe. And this season will probably tell us, is this how it's going to be going forward, or was last year a weird blip on the radar? And that happens sometimes. You go and you look back at uh, different career stats. I know Jeff McNeil couple years back hit I believe over 20 homers and he's hit like 30 home runs since then so you kind of sometimes have these kind of weird years that are not truly indicative of the type of player you are so watching Brandon M1 2024 for that uh, will be huge all right I wanted to close out the show more with a topic rather than a mailbag because it's just something we've been texting about and it's it just goes to show you uh the variance in baseball with pitching right now Unfortunately, Lucas Giolito, who signed a two-year deal with the Red Sox, it sounds like, you know, with his elbow injury, he could miss all of 2024 right now. We spent the whole offseason, Joe, talking about Giolito being this guy that, while the results haven't been what people had hoped for, he is somebody that makes his starts, gives you innings, and can be a serviceable pitcher, if not a good one. And it just goes to show you, Joe, how crazy it is. This is a guy that was signed because of his reliability and durability, and without even making a regular season start for the Red Sox, might not pitch at all this year. And it, you know, you said something really interesting to me when we were texting, and this is important because of this show, focusing on free agency, pitch, uh, pitching and free agency, needing pitching next year, needing pitching now, arguably. Joe, we're at a point where it feels like there are a lot of guys that you're afraid to pay because they've always been hurt or don't pitch a lot like Blake Snell, not a big innings guy. But then the flip side is the workhorses. Eventually it does catch up to them. And we've even seen it here with all the injuries Max Scherzer dealt with throughout his time as a Met, a guy that was known as a workhorse. So Joe, do you think this is just magnifying the point and amplifying the point of you better have volume in your system because the premiums people pay on the free agent market and the volatility and overall miss rate of it is trending in an awful direction. You need to attack pitching in numbers. That That's truly what I believe. It, Like you said, Connor, I, I texted it in a, a, a different way where I basically just said, pitchers who don't pitch enough are bad. Pitchers who pitch too much are bad because they're going to get hurt. So when, when you look at it and you think, ahead i i really want to try to not spend so much time on like next off season i know there's a lot of talk about that because we're about to start a season where the mets are going to be trying to compete for a playoff spot but it just gives me the heebie-jeebies a little bit to think of giving corbin burns 250 million dollars because he's been so reliable throughout his career and then boom just one day his elbow goes popping there goes 16 months 17 months of this massive contract it 
it honestly is scaring me off from wanting to pay starting pitching much at all. It makes it makes me want to just attack it with a bunch of, you know, a bunch of arms. And like you said, importantly, start developing your own that you have cost controlled. So that way you're not, you know, footing this huge bill for a guy on your injured list and stack up the offense with as much talent as you can and make pitching work. And this isn't a one-off. I mean, look at the Yankees last year with the deal they gave Carlos Rodon and and how little he was able to pitch, how ineffective he was when he came back. I mean, there are many, many examples of this across the league. It is uh, it was just something we had to touch on because this podcast spent a lot of time talking about Giolito and this podcast has spent a lot of time talking about the need for arms next year when the Mets have a lot of open spots in the rotation. And I think for the Met fan, it only enhances – how much you are hoping one or two out of Mike Vassell, Christian Scott, and Dom Hamill can be a part of this rotation because they are young guys. They are from this system. Not only are they cost effective, but they also are in the quantity that if you can have them fill one or two spots, it would make the Mets uh, lives next offseason much easier. Joe, we don't get to do this often because our show is usually jammed, but it's a good time to close out the show asking you for your closing thoughts, really, for the rest of spring training for the Mets here, or maybe not the rest, but where we are now, where the roster has gotten smaller, the young guys that are going to be on this team, no matter what, needing to produce more, and of course, the rotation trying to take shape. As we stand today, stay healthy. That's really my number one thing. You're seeing all these injuries start to flare up. Justin Verlander starting on the injured list. Lucas Giolito injured. Kodai Senga, obviously, with the Mets starting on the injured list. Ronald Acuna. I just... Yeah, Ronald Acuna dealing with some uh, swelling around his knee. So let's just get to March 28th. Let's let's try to coast through. Let's not get hurt. And, you know, I want to continue to watch Brett Beatty. I want to continue to watch Mark Vientos. That's where my focus is really on offensively for the rest of the spring. Pete Alonzo and Lindor and, and those guys, they're going to do their thing. They're just getting ready for the regular season. Beatty and Vientos, I think they have something to prove, not just obviously during regular season games, but they have something to prove every single day they head to the ballpark. All right, this is the Mets pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Elevate your style in a Cadillac. Go from bold to bolder in an SUV, from inspiring to awe-inspiring in a sedan. Visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today. And remember, if you want to make sure you never miss a show, subscribe to our show at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SMY's YouTube channel if you want to watch the show or wherever you get your podcast. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll catch you next week.